Hello everyone and welcome to August's BMS talk. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our chair for this evening, Dan Beber, who's Associate Professor at the Department of Biosciences, University of Exeter, and also the FBR Committee Chair for the BMS. So thank you very much, Dan. Over to you. Sorry. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, so we've got two uh, fantastic talks this evening for you. Um, if you have questions along the way, then please do enter those into the chat, which will then allow us to um, uh, manage those uh, after the after the talks. Um, and uh, so we'll now ask uh, Rebecca to uh, turn off her camera and microphone, and I will introduce. Eileen Baird to you. So Eileen is a, an ecologist specialising in mycology and woodlands. Uh, she is uh, lead advisor for Tree Action Plan Delivery at Natural England, advising and providing practical support for woodland creation and management in the northwest of England. Uh, previously, sorry, it's probably Aileen, isn't it? I do apologise. Worked as a mycologist at the Birmingham Institute of Forest Research where she researched changing fungal populations in forests under increased concentrations of carbon dioxide using the Bifor face experiment in Staffordshire. And uh, Aileen's talk title is The Importance of Fungi in the Context of UK Woodland Creation. And I'll hand over to Aileen now. Lovely, thank you. So I'll just share my screen. And hopefully that looks okay. Can everybody see that? Dan, you'll have to let me know whether that looks all right. That looks good, but you're not in presentation mode. Not in presentation mode, okay. I think it's because it's across two screens, hold on. Sorry, everybody. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, we're there. Wonderful. Okay, thanks everybody. So yeah, so I am Aileen and I'm going to talk today about a paper that um, me and my supervisor during my PhD wrote that was published um, last year. And this discusses, um, the, like Dan said, the importance of fungi in the context of UK tree planting. Um, perhaps I'm slightly preaching to the choir here with um, this BMS audience about how important fungi are. Um, but it's definitely something that uh, within the work that I do now, mainly focusing on woodland creation, that's very much in the forefront of my mind. So the sort of um, beginning of this work started with the publication of the England Tree Action Plan, um, which was published um, just over two years ago now in summer 2021. And this was a policy document that looks at um, what the sort of plans for woodland creation um, and woodland management um, were in the in the UK across um, a number of years. And a lot of the work in this document or a lot of the um, policy and guidelines in this document is looking at woodland creation and um, the importance of that and the importance of that in the context of the UK climate strategy. And so at the time was um, reading through this document, um, looking at the the kind of very ambitious and significant targets that it makes and, and how big of an impact that this would have on um, UK um, ecology um, as a whole, not just woodland ecology. So um, the things that are set out in this document is looking at increasing tree cover by a very significant percentage. So we have a relatively low um, percentage cover of woodlands in the UK compared with um, other areas of Europe, for example. So we currently only have 13 to 14% tree cover or woodland cover in, in the UK compared with something like 40% in France. So it's it's a we have quite low woodland cover. And so this document looks at setting out how much um, how many woodlands we're aiming to create. So increasing our percentage cover from 13% up to 17 to 20%, um, a goal of 30,000 hectares per year. So huge differences. And the thing that struck me whilst reading through this. Um, pages of this document is that fungi weren't mentioned at all um, 
And to me, this was a, a huge, um, a huge thing that was missing. We've got a whole kingdom of life that's just not been mentioned here. And so wanted to do some work looking at um, how important fungi are in the context of woodland creation and whether there were any um, guidelines or recommendations that we could set out for um, people working on the ground in woodland creation, but also policymakers to ensure that this um, kind of big oversight doesn't necessarily happen again. Um, so this is that was the sort of um, trigger for this piece of work. So the first thing that we started with is looking at um, what aspects or how fungi are relevant um, in woodlands and woodland creation. And so the first thing that came to mind was fungal disease. And so disease is something that actually is mentioned in this document, but very broadly, it's very much used in, the, you know, in a phrase of pests and diseases as this overarching concept. Um, and as many of you are probably aware, we already have quite a few um, severe tree diseases in the UK, ash dieback being a key one that's currently having a very big impact. Um, but there's also been other diseases, so Dutch elm disease, and we have quite a number of um, other diseases that are potentially on the way or are in smaller numbers in the UK. Um, and then the other thing is that climate change is very likely to affect the tree disease burden that we have. So things like increasing temperatures um, changes in um, drought and rainfall, things like that will have big impacts in the, the areas that various um, diseases can survive in and potentially the um, then the number of trees or the area that could be affected by those diseases. So the next thing that we considered um, in the context of fungi and woodland creation is the effects of fungi on human health. Um, and I think this is something that's quite often not, um, not necessarily considered, but fungi release millions of spores and those spores actually act in or can act in quite a similar way to pollen. So when we think about um, a lot of the really common symptoms that people get when there's high pollen levels, hay fever, things like that, that can also happen with um, fungal spores. And so that's something that quite often happens when you get things like thunderstorms, you get real changes in pressure and humidity that can trigger big spore releases and um, can have similar symptoms. And it can be much more severe than just the kind of mild hay fever symptoms, you know, exacerbation of, of asthma attacks and things like that. And so there's uh, records in, within the medical community looking at after thunderstorms, they get a big, a big spike in, in cases of, you know, children coming to emergency departments um, with asthma and things like that. And if we have um, an increase in woodland cover, we could also have a big increase in fungal spore numbers and potentially changes with climate change again and how this may um, affect um, the release of fungal spores and the number of spores. And so if we're increasing our woodland cover by 5-10% um, when our baseline is, um, is only 13, that could have a, re a really big impact on the concentrations of spores that we've got in the air. Um, Another huge factor, and I think this is one of the most significant ones, is just how valuable and important fungi are in the context of um, carbon cycling and nutrient cycling. So one of the, um, the biggest targets that this the Tree Action Plan sets out is how trees can be used to combat climate change. And without, uh, without fungi, we don't have, you know, they're a huge part of the carbon cycle. And so there is essential if we're calculating how much carbon these trees might be able to take up um, without the fungi that that carbon cycle simply doesn't work. So, uh, you know, we have our mycorrhizal fungi, which are harvesting lots of um, nutrients from the soils and they're uh, working in this symbiotic relationship with the tree. And they've got this nutrient and sugar exchange. Um, but these mycorrhizal fungi are also storing in their own fungal biomass, they're storing massive amounts of carbon in the soil itself. And then we also have our sapro saprotrophs, our decomposer fungi that are breaking down all of these dead, pl dead plant materials. Um, many of them have um, enzymes and they're doing a lot of the hard work, breaking down a lot of these um, challenging uh, compounds that are in plant cell walls that can't necessarily be broken down by other organisms and that releases carbon. And so there's a balance between the fungi that we have in the soil um, that are releasing carbon and the fungi we have in the soil that are taking up carbon. And understanding that and the balance between them is really critical in 
um, in understanding what impact planting trees or managing existing woodlands is going to have on um, carbon storage and the impact that might have on our kind of national carbon balance as a whole. Um, and the other aspect to consider here is, again, the impact that climate change will have on um, on these fungi. So um, a lot of recent studies are looking at how the distribution of fungi of different types of mycorrhizae, for example, might change with climate change and different types of tree associating with different types of fungi and what that might mean for changing carbon storage um, as, as we go forward. And uh, the final aspect that we considered is as, as well as thinking about, you know, the three previous aspects, which is how fungi might affect trees um, and woodlands, is actually thinking about how all these new woodlands could affect fungi. Um, so we have many internationally important fungal communities in the UK and grassland fungi are particularly important. Um, so these are internationally rare and we have a, a sort of stronghold here in the UK. Um, the habitat for these fungi is low nutrient grassland, so it's quite often sheep grazed, um, sheep grazed uplands. Quite often these areas are quite um, botanically poor and so they may not necessarily be picked up on a lot of the standard checks that um, woodland creation advisors, people like myself, they, they wouldn't necessarily be easily picked up on the standard checks that are done. People are looking for high plant diversity, um, they're looking for peat soils, things like this. But um, if you, many people will not necessarily have the, the knowledge in the background where they're realising that this could be a really valuable habitat for fungi. And um, planting trees on, on, on these grasslands could cause massive damage to these fungal communities. The mycorrhizal fungi on tree roots outcompete these grassland fungi. Um, and so tree planting can also be a real threat to fungi. And so we have all of these reasons why tree planting and woodland creation in general is really important. It's really important to consider fungi in these aspects. And so I think it highlights just how much of a, an omission, the lack of um, fungal sort of guidelines and messaging that there was in this initial um, document. So once we've kind of looked at all of these possible um, influences that fungi can have in tree planting, what we then set out to do is create some guidelines and some suggestions for how they could be included in existing policy and how this could be used by people on the ground. Um, because, you know, it was all well and good highlighting how important fungi are, but without setting out what what people on the ground and policymakers can actually do about it, it's how can we um, how can we take action on this? Um, so the first thing we discussed is looking at monitoring the spread of fungal diseases. And this is something that I think is already being done quite well. Um, there is a number of there are a number of um, sort of national strategies. So there's a couple of things that I've looked at here. So we have the UK Plant Health Risk Register and this lists um, it's not just fungal diseases. It's a wider range of um, pests and diseases. Um, that are threats to trees and, and, um, and other plants. And this is now becoming quite comprehensive. So when we wrote the paper, it was earlier in its development. And so there were quite a lot of species that were missing on there, but now it's, it's becoming really quite a comprehensive list. And this is a really valuable tool for looking at the spread of diseases and how that might affect, um, affect trees and wider plants um, as, yeah, as, as disease threats progress. And then there's also the observatory project, which um, many of you may also already be aware of. So this is a um, citizen science community science project that's helping to train people up in um, identifying and recording when they spot pests and diseases. And it forms a, a network of people, much like we have a lot of the, um, the BMS recording networks, a network of people that are recording um, disease threats and this is a really valuable data set that can feed into um, research and policy things like that. So the next thing we discussed is about designing um, woodland creation schemes well and, and this is important for a, a wide variety of reasons not just fungi but I think fungi influence in many of them so thinking about avoiding planting in habitats that will cause more carbon release than storage and so 
you know, these are habitats that are more likely to have the fungi that suit trees well already in their soils. Um, they're unlikely to release more carbon. So things like deep peat soils are um, the carbon release through carbon dioxide and methane, if you plant trees on these areas, is, is much more significant than the carbon storage that you get from that tree planting. And so thinking about planting um, suitable trees that, that are adapted to the kind of habitat that we're talking about is really important. Um, and also thinking about how those trees might be resilient to climate change as that progresses over the lifetime of a tree, because obviously with trees, we're discussing a lifetime that is well above a uh, human lifetime. And so we're kind of thinking on a time scale that's quite, um, quite unnatural or quite difficult sometimes to conceptualize. Um, things like avoiding monocultures. So this is particularly important from a disease aspect. Um, but also from a biodiversity aspect. So if we have a wider diversity of trees, it's less likely to be susceptible to disease because um, you don't have a, you know, a disease which wipes out your entire woodland. You may create some spaces, but then they're more likely to fill with other species that are there um, and you have a, a higher mix of species. And so higher, higher biodiversity, which in itself is a benefit. And um, also, context of well-designed schemes, we're also thinking about protecting our existing environmental assets. And so um, we already have um, kind of agreements in place across um, national sort of policymakers and things like that. So between Natural England and Forestry Commission, there are agreements that we don't plant trees on existing priority habitats. So that's areas that have got high plant diversity. And I think there should be uh, or one of the things that we argue for in this paper is that we should have the same arguments for habitats that are high in fungal diversity as well. We might have uh, at the moment a uh, less of understanding of the um, the spread of these habitats across the UK and things like that, but that's no reason that we shouldn't be protecting the ones that we we do know about and fungi um, arguing that case that fungi are equally as important as um, plants and animals. So. The next thing we advocate for is um, spore forecasting. And so this is in the context of what I was saying about um, human health and the risks that you can get from high spore levels. So something that um, I imagine everyone is familiar with is when you have your weather forecast, um, especially in the summer um, or spring and summer when pollen levels are high, that's normally something that's, that's on the weather forecast, it's easily accessible. Um, and so we advocate for adding a spore forecast to this too. This is something that, um, is the data is already available online, but it's not, um, you have to go searching for it. And so something as simple as adding this to your, you know, evening weather forecast after the news would be very straightforward and make that data accessible to people um, and enable people to manage the risk their own to their own health. Um, another thing we advocate for is the UK Red List. Um, obviously, this is a huge challenge to bring this together. However, I think it is a vitally important tool, particularly for people who don't have a background in mycology. It's something that's very critical for um, policymakers. It's internationally recognised. There's very strict criteria for how um, how species can be added to the red list. Um, and because of how readily used it is across all disciplines, um, it is something that is would be very valuable. Um, and so development of this list would be a, a really useful tool um, that would enable easy, it, it would make it easier to advocate for the importance of fungi across a wider range of um, wider range of policymakers essentially. Um, and then another very important thing that we discuss is assessing sites for fungi. And so currently, um, when you're doing perhaps a planning application or perhaps when you are developing a woodland creation scheme, there are certain surveys or things that are recommended and some that are compulsory. So it's compulsory to do checks, for example, for um, historic environments. So looking at, you know, are there Roman ruins underneath your land. Um, quite often it's compulsory to do surveys for things like bats or great crested newts. However, as far as I'm aware, there are no um, 
there's no policy or requirements to do surveys for fungi. And this, this really limits our availability to gather baseline data for, for areas. So we don't have that assessment of what fungi are there in the first place before we, before we make any changes. And a change as significant as making that compulsory in, in some cases. So say, for example, we're looking at a, an area that could be really valuable habitat for grassland fungi. We've identified that it meets a lot of the criteria that grassland fungi um, are well suited to. It might be then that it's compulsory to do a survey for fungi before you do woodland creation or any other type of major habitat or major land use change. Um, and this would be really valuable in multiple ways. So it would give us a chance to um, increase massively the amount of data collection we have on fungi across the UK. And it would also provide us with some baseline data. So I know there are some projects going on at Forest Research at the moment, looking at how soil fungal communities change over time um, before trees are planted and after trees are planted. Um, but being able to massively increase the number of woodlands that we're studying through that would be a hugely valuable data set and it would give us more certainty as to the impacts that tree planting has on fungal communities. So, for example, do we have, well, if we've got a, an area of land that's been used for um, agriculture, it's, it's had, I don't know, wheat growing on it for 200 years. Um, it's been really heavily fertilised. Um, it's had a deep plough, things like that. Whether the fungi that are present in that soil, do we have different fungi that are there compared with an area that's uh, been managed in a completely different way? I don't know, for example, a really highly biodiverse grassland. Um, it's likely, very likely that there are different fungi there, but how do they change if you plant trees on that land? Um, does that, you know, do we have changes in how the fungi um, associated with the trees, those communities, do they develop differently over time? Do the trees grow less well? Do they grow um, more slowly? All of these are really important questions, not only from the, you know, the mycology side, where we're interested in what the fungal communities are doing, but also from the perspective of the success of the woodland creation. Um, we know that drought, particularly um, the drought and hot weather that we've had in the last year, have really decreased the success of a lot of woodland creation schemes. So trees that were planted late in the spring have not been surviving well through the summer. And that's a really huge um, waste of time, money, of resource, um, of carbon, of all those trees that were grown and have now died, um, and the transport of those trees around. And so the success of the tree planting is also really dependent potentially on what these fungi are doing. And so the fact that we have um, so little information on how fungi might be changing across lifetimes of a woodland creation scheme is a really huge piece of the puzzle. And I think of probably all of the recommendations, this is the one that I think is the most valuable. So we're thinking about um, fungal fruiting data. And so that is um, specific surveys, but also um, those kind of um, odd records that that um, we have, we you know, within the, the BMS recording community, people that are going out and doing their own recording. Um, all of those records, whether it's from a you know specific person that's been commissioned to go out and do a survey on a piece of land or whether it's from you know those community records, all of those form a really big picture. And then something that is becoming increasingly more common is to use um, eDNA. And so this is where you're taking soil samples and then sending them off to a lab to do DNA sequencing and you get back your list of what fungal species are found in that soil. Um, so at the moment, that's most commonly being used for, well, used in, in research of woodlands where it's across a full swathe of um, fungal species. But I think within, at least from what I've seen within um, the kind of more on the ground um, tree planting is, is very much focused on grassland fungi. And I think it's really only in the last year that it's becoming a bit more common that this could be requested. And the advantage of eDNA is that it's not, um, you're not dependent on what time of year the fungi are fruiting or whether the fungi are fruiting at all. Um, and so this can be a really valuable asset for um, farmers and landowners because the tree planting season we're planting from October through to March. 
depending on what the weather is like during that time. Basically, you're planting when it's cold. Um, and so if you're needing to do um, surveys for fungal fruit bodies in the autumn, that doesn't give you a lot of time. It doesn't really give you enough time to then, um, you know, for your whoever's doing that survey to collate all of those results, send you a report, and then you have enough time to order your trees, book contractors, fencing, all those kinds of things. That timing is quite a challenge. And so being able to do an eDNA survey in March or April is a big advantage for the timeline of woodland creation. Um, and it can also be more accessible being able to take a handful of soil samples compared with paying for potentially several days of a um, consultant's time, particularly um, when, as I'm sure we all know, the number of, you know, experienced, um, you know, experienced surveyors that are out able to do fungal fruit body surveys is quite limited currently. Um, and so this kind of data collection, whether that is fruit body surveys or whether that's eDNA is, is really valuable. And so the final thing that I just want to mention is a project that um, I'm working on currently with a couple of other people in Natural England. So Matt Wainhouse and Sean Cooch, and then um, Susan Jarvis and Fiona Seaton over at UKCEH. And so what we're doing within this project is doing some modelling work, looking at the distribution of grassland fungi. So um, where I mentioned previously that the grassland fungi are really threatened by woodland creation, um, what we're aiming to do is we've collated, well, Sean has collated a large database of um, a, a big number of grassland fungi records across England. And we also have some records from um, the UK more widely. And um, Susan and Fiona over at uh, UKCH are doing some modelling work for us where um, we're comparing the um, the database of records that we've got with other variables that may correlate with them. And so that might be things like land use, soil type, temperature, elevation, this sort of thing. Um, the idea being to generate a predictive model um, in a map form of where the distribution of grassland fungi may be across um, England and the UK more widely. The idea being that where we have um, kind of patchy records or some recorder bias that we may be able to use this as a tool to uh, predict where we might have really high diversity of grassland fungi and so where we might need to be looking more carefully for um, these type of habitats and potentially requesting surveys before trees are planted. Um, and this could be a really valuable tool um, for people working on the ground who don't necessarily have a lot of mycology experience and it's an added data set that they can use to help identify potentially important fungal habitats and know when they do or don't need to request further surveys for an area. So the modelling for this is currently in progress. We're hoping to have some um, preliminary maps by the end of August, so in a few weeks time. Um, and then what we're hoping to do is some um, on the ground validation work in the autumn. So we have got some consultants who are going to um, go out and do some of this for us. But we're also looking for if we have um, anyone within the BMS recording community who is keen to get involved and would be happy to do um, some work out in their local area. Um, whether that's on just one of your autumn fungal forays, that would be great. So um, what we're going to be doing is sending out um, in the recording network newsletter, Nathan's going to add um, um, a description of this project and what the sort of thing we're looking for. And so that will hopefully be out once we've got some of the early modelling results and what we might be looking for. If anyone is keen to get involved, um, then keep your eyes peeled for that um, notice in the newsletter because that will be out soon. So on that, um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, what I will do is once we've had questions and things like that, I will put in the chat, I'll put the link to the paper. It's open access. So if you would like to read read the paper fully, um, I'll stick that in the chat. And then there was also a short summary article that we had in the conversation that was also published at a similar time to the paper. So I'll put both of those links in the chat um, for anybody that's interested in hearing more or if there's anything that you think I should have explained better as I went along hopefully that will give you some more context and uh, with that I'm happy to take any questions that people might have. Great lovely thank you Aileen. Um, so yeah uh, so if, if everyone could pop their questions 
in the chat uh, as they come through. We've we've had one. Uh, is there? Uh, in, so in the USA, there's a, a continental uh, micro blitz where people are asked to take photos of mushrooms everywhere they go um, for future analysis. Um, does is, does that kind of thing happen? I don't think we have that in the UK. The closest we have is the um, National Biodiversity Database, I guess. Um, but in terms of photographs, I don't think we have it, do we? No, I mean, I think probably the closest we have is, you know, the apps we've got like iRecord and iNaturalist. And so mm. people can submit records through those where, you know, if you haven't got, a, if you're not able to have an ID at that time, um, you can record them through there. And I think, I mean, I guess in some ways the, the BMS Facebook page that we have, although it's not necessarily going through to formal records, it is that community of people who can um, help you identify fungi. I think the thing that I would encourage people to do is um, is to submit your records, um, even if it's species that you think are really common. Um, I think having that, you know, is is something that we're using now and are really valuable is is those community submitted records, whether that's on FRDBI or iRecord, iNaturalist, wherever that ends up being, um, they're really valuable. And so I would encourage people to do that, even if you're seeing, I don't know, ink caps or something that are really common and you think it's not worth it, it's still valuable data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I found some uh, chanterelles recently, but I'm not telling anybody where I found them. <laughs> um, uh, right, so tree warden, uh, where we are plants, so this is from Anne Westover, sorry, uh, where we are planting trees, spinnies on agricultural land. Are there measures uh, we should employ to encourage new fungal communities, such as mulches or gaps or deadwood? Um, so I think. Um, Kind of two things on this so the first one is i would discourage the use of the sort of um the mycorrhizal i don't know products inoculants that you can buy quite often these are very generic sometimes the species aren't even uk sourced um and so although in theory they could be a good concept the um the way that they're being used and the species that are being used are not necessarily good at all so i wouldn't bother with them they're probably they'll do nothing and they could be harmful um, in terms of things like mulch and deadwood, I think if you've already got um, deadwood and things like that on the land or that's available, you know, on the same farm that's that's local, then I think that's great. You know, you're you're going to have lots of fungi that are associated with that. Um, and so if there's something that's already available from the local area, then that will be a great way of increasing the fungal diversity as a whole. And that will form a really important part of the um, the woodland structure, deadwoods, a vital part of woodlands. And so that's definitely something that will be um, certainly beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, where will uh, CHEGD, I don't even know, I'm really sorry, I don't know what that stands for, CHEGD fungi map will be available. So yeah, that's the, the grassland fungi map. Um, so it's going to be, um, it's going to be published, it will be publicly available in terms of timelines, I'm not sure on that yet. We're quite early in the stages of this project. So um, the modelling is is happening, I was going to say, as we speak, probably not literally as we speak, because I imagine Susan's not working right now, but it will be, um, we're currently working on it. And so that will be something we'll provide updates um, through the BMS newsletter um, and it will be, yeah, publicly available. Um, a good question here from David Lonsdale. Plant, planting of imported trees poses a serious risk of introduction of alien pests and pathogens. Um, should we be relying solely on planting stock uh, from the UK? Uh, yes, I think as far as possible and as local as possible um, is great. Um, there are obviously considerations to make in terms of climate and the impact that that might have on how trees can survive. So I know there's a bit of a sort of um, division sometimes within the woodland creation community of whether we should be, for example, in the southeast of England using oak that's sourced from the south of France to help it um, be more uh, resilient to the increased temperatures and the increased droughts that we're getting. Um, and then there's kind of another camp that's the, you know, the more locally we can grow these trees. So if you're down in Kent, you you have trees that are grown in Kent. Um, from the perspective of, yeah, pests and diseases, then we obviously have to manage and monitor that, that spread. There definitely is a big trade of um, wood-based products and trees and things like that. And that's where having to 
that's never going to stop. And so that's where monitoring these diseases is really important and how they might be spread across the UK and then, you know, more widely internationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of questions here about inoculating plants before planting. Is that yeah, it's an interesting one that because yeah, when we've got you know a lot of these agricultural soils that have been really intensively used, potentially they don't have um, you know ectomycorrhizae that are tree associated. They may not have them or in high um, in high numbers in those soils, um, but. At the moment, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any sort of widely available products that is like I was saying before, quite often they're not even UK fungi that are in these products. Um, and so we kind of don't really have a good understanding of how fungal communities develop over time um, once you've planted a tree and how that how that goes forward as it establishes. And so I think um, kind of doing yeah inoculations of trees when they're being you know when they're being grown from seed things like that that could be really valuable but we don't understand enough how the trees established to to understand that well and so i would be pushing for testing that rather than suddenly launching in with a um, a product before we really know how that how that works mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh just as uh observation from john watt here um head of the city on i know some uh in conifer plantations as a correlation with previous land use so do we need to you know do we need to consider previous land use when we're deciding which species to plant i guess is the question yeah and i think um that is to an extent that is a consideration but it is definitely a challenge i mean it's something that i come across quite commonly it's it's you know the um you know farmers are coming forward with little corners of their land the ones that are the least productive to them it's not necessarily the ones that we would choose as the most suitable area for planting trees and so it's kind of working within the land that is available and the information that we've got but things like that where we have got these okay we've got correlations between certain pests or diseases that are more common in certain in you know land use history that's different um, is an important thing to consider and it's something that we know generally very little about and um, developing or gathering that fungal data is really important to contribute to that so that we can use that when we're making decisions about where we should or shouldn't um, plant trees. Question here from Helen Baker, do we need more fungal SSSIs? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so I think it, it's quite challenging to get new um, new triple SIs designated. And a lot of the triple SIs that we do have that could be really valuable for fungi don't necessarily have fungi in their um, in their citation. So they're not listed. Um, but there's definitely I mean, I'm thinking here grassland fungi from um, what Sean has told me. There's there's a, a large number of sites that would be um that are eligible eligible to be a triple si under the current um the current recommendations and so there's plenty of sites that are good enough to be a triple si from you know they're really a valuable site for fungi but aren't currently listed as one um so yeah i would argue yes that would be great we could have loads more <laughs> uh observation from cam here um so professor roy watling uh, did some work inoculating trees with some secondhand pharmaceutical machinery. I mean, if he's, if he's still available, he may be able to uh, help out. I, I mean, I'm aware that uh, you know one can purchase hazels with uh, truffles uh, ready, ready, ready inoculated in them. I don't know if <laughs> that's something we want to be looking into. Um, yeah, I think that you know there are there are products available, and I know there are various people that are doing research and developing products that are more locally sourced. So things like where they're doing, um, creating, you know, a product for, I don't know, Lancashire, for example, where it's using fungi that are, um, you know, their inoculant is collected from fungi that they've collected in Lancashire. Mm -hmm. So things like that could be really important. Um, and I think I'd definitely be more comfortable with something that's um, with you know UK fungal species but I think even then we just we don't really know the impact that that's actually going to have on how the trees establish and what that means long term for the soil fungal communities we, we just don't really have that data and so 
I think I would really be wanting to see how just having more data on what what fungi are doing if we're we're not you know if we're kind of taking a bit of a hands-off approach to fungi what they do on their you know on their own and then whether actually mm -hmm. we can sort of help okay. boost that with um products is kind of another thing yep. okay um just looking at the time we can probably fit one or two more in so uh, one is about this balance between uh, you know, um, carbon sequestration and then uh, respiration via saprotrophs and you know the the degree to which that is considered in planting projects. Um, any uh, specific emerging ideas, proposals coming out of that? The yeah, I mean, I think from an on the ground perspective, it's not something that's considered currently. There's there's quite a lot of work that's come, that's currently being done at Forest Research on this, amongst other research groups. Um, and I think this is something that is, yeah, is, is vitally important because if we, you know, a lot of these or the kind of the big driver for all of this woodland creation is for climate mitigation and so if that's not if it's not having that desired effect then obviously we do have other very significant benefits in terms of biodiversity and things like that so it's not a hundred percent about um carbon storage but when, when that's such a big driver we do need to understand it better um and so yeah research is happening and i think the more we can do on that the better really i mean in the long run the carbon balance of woodlands is zero um, so the only way we can store long term is to harvest the trees and turn them into buildings, I think. But um, yeah. OK, um, so just one more, I think. Um, yeah, it's a good question about the kind of economic importance of, of fungi um, like well, the edible fungi generally, I suppose. Um, and whether that's kind of an, uh, something that's of interest. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something that I think in the in the uk is a much smaller kind of um it's a much smaller economic thing than it is in other countries for sure um you know we obviously have people that are um foraging but the scale of that is minute compared with um other other areas um and it could be something that could be um developed more widely i think because we have such low woodland cover compared with other countries that the numbers of fungi that we're talking about here is potentially much smaller you know than the other countries that have got 10, 20 times more trees than we've got. Um, and so I think that is something that's always going to be a consideration that if we've got a much smaller area of woodland, then just purely the number of fungi that we're getting out of that is going to be much less valuable. But I think it could be something that could be developed further and it might be something that helps kind of um, add to the economic benefits that we're getting from our woodlands amongst all the other benefits that we get from them. And if it's another benefit that, that could be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm looking at the time. I think we're going to move on. I'm sorry, there's a great question there about glomalin. Um, yes, it's very important. I'll just answer that one briefly. <laughs> um, so we'll, we will now uh, move on. Thank you so much uh, to Aileen. Um, uh, fascinating project. I must get in touch with you afterwards, actually, um, so about, about some of that stuff. Um, so we are now going to uh, move on to our second talk, uh, which is from Rebecca Rivera. Um, she's a postgraduate student at Trinity College Dublin School of Natural Sciences and Research Centre in Applied Geosciences. Her research focuses on documenting microscopic fossil fungi from peatlands across Ireland and examining their use as indicators of past environments. Personally, Rebecca is interested in the societal impacts of climate change and a sustainable future. Rebecca's talk title is Fungi and Other Microorganisms as Indicators of Peatland Response to Climate Change, Health and Restoration. Okay, thanks. Rebecca, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Just pop on the screen. Um, all good? Yep, that's perfect. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm Rebecca and um, I just started my PhD in last September, so I'm a year in now. 
Um, I'm working on the supervision of Carla J. Harper. Um, she's based in Trinity College, um, where I am. And then I also have a co-supervisor in, who is Jennifer O'Keefe, and she's based in Moorhead State University in the US. Um, so I'll just begin by giving a brief context of peatlands um, and why we're looking at them, why we care. Um, so globally, peatlands cover about 3% of the land um, and they're our largest terrestrial carbon stock and they approximately, it's estimated that they hold 550 gigatons of carbon. Um, so bringing that into an Irish context, about a fifth of our land is covered by peatlands. Um, so that is kind of roughly estimated to be 1.5 hectares, uh, 1.5 million hectares of peat. Um, but that that figure kind of changes. Um, I know when I started my undergrad, it was about 16% was estimate. So kind of as we look at satellite data and surveys, it's it's starting to increase, um, which is quite interesting. Um, so peatlands in Ireland, they're culturally, economically and ecologically important um, and they very much have a historical significance here. Um, so of board de Mona has documented about hundred over a thousand species of plants and animals in the peatlands that they own and uh, board de Mona is a semi-state kind of energy company here. Um, and of the peatlands they own, it's estimated that about 100 million tons of carbon will be stored by them. Um, so I think it's just obvious from those figures that peatlands will be central to Ireland's climate action plan um, in the years ahead. And um, the picture I have here, I just thought it was nice to show the significance of peatlands here. Um, it's the first international peat symposium and um, all the delegates are look uh, visiting the Consat Bog in County Offaly, and this is from 1954. Um, so moving on, we'll look at fungi in peatlands, why we're here, what we're all interested in. Um, so globally, there's in 2007, it was documented that about 600 fungi species um, were kind of documented in this paper. Um, and obviously, I imagine that's quite dated, and I'm not too sure how accurate that would be because I've only come across one paper that has even mentioned it um, which is kind of bizarre just what Eileen was saying the, kind of the the lack of information on on fungi is, is you know it's a whole kingdom um so of those 600 species uh predominantly they're ascomycetes uh followed by psidiomycetes then zygomycetes and then chytrid Tridiomycetes. Um, so in Ireland, it's fungi are really poorly documented here. Um, there's no extensive kind of atlas for fungi, um, never mind in peatlands. Um, there's one paper that has documented uh, fungi, and that was done in 1969 by Dixon Dooley um, here in Trinity. Um, so when we're looking at fungi that we find in the field, we're using the Complete Guide to British Mushrooms and Toadstools and the Roger Phillips um, Mushroom Book. Um, so we're kind of, it's quite early days in terms of documenting fungi in Ireland. And um, I know our research group is, is really trying to give a push of just if people are out for walks or anything to just start documenting what they're seeing. Um, so fungi are very important to peatlands. Um, they're essential to the health. Um, they're fundamental to a lot of processes in these ecosystems, um, such as the nutrient cycles, so carbon cycles, decomposition, so how the soil is being made, and um, biodiversity in them as well, they're important too. And fungi are highly uh, specialised in peatlands. And these pictures here, um, they're taken from Peatland Park in uh, Armagh in the north of Ireland. Um, so fungi and pollenology, um, that's what I, I'm looking at. So there's been extensive research on pollen um, in the pa pollenology and paleoecology record. Um, but there's massive gaps in regards to fungi. 
and talking to pollinologists and and professors it's it's not that they haven't found the fungi they just don't seem to know what to do with them so they haven't um kind of published them or anything so i imagine there's a lot of information that is out there but it just hasn't been published yet um so fungi fall under the term non-pollen polymorph um which is basically everything but pollen when you're looking at uh these microscopic objects and uh, they can be defined as microscopic objects of about 10 to 250 microns in size which can be found alongside pollen during routine pollen counting um, so emphasis on the pollen there and not the fungi um, so I just have a few few images of what pollen typically looks like under the microscope um, so MPPs there's over 1300 different types um, they as it is everything but pollen, it, it encompasses a wide variety of, of um, organisms. So we, we have our fungi, we have arthropods, um, tested amoebae, and this is just a selection of what they typically look like. Um, the kind of main database we're working off is just called, if you Google non-pollen polymorph database, um, you'll get a plethora of images of these um, different specimens and that's kind of what we're working off when we're looking at what we're finding and comparing them to these these images and a lot of this work in Europe was began about 1970 and um, by Bas van Giel um, and then there kind of seems to be a lull in, in the research um, but it's kind of kicking off again now um, looking at fungi in pollinological uh, records um, so what can why, why are we studying these? Um, so using MPPs, they can be used as proxies. Um, so they're useful for paleo, paleoecological indicators. And they're very useful for reconstructing local conditions and past environments. And I think personally, they're really interesting study because they really complement existing data sets already out there, um, whether that's looking at pollen data sets or micro charcoal data sets or tephra data sets, um, it slots in very nicely. And I think it will give a very nice, um, wider and more detailed picture of these past environments. Um, so just giving some examples, we have uh, Coprophyllus fungi. So this is fungi that typically grows on dung or wood. Um, so their indicators can indicate herbivore present in the environment and some of these can be host-specific. Um, another example will be Carmenicolus fungi, so that indicates um, fire and fire regimes um, as these fungi grow on coal. Um, and another example I, I particularly like um, to show how this uh, MPP datasets will um, complement existing data sets is of the Tulund Man, um, which is a body that was found in Denmark. And I think it dates back to about early Iron Age. Um, so uh, there was a recent kind of uh, new analysis done on the gut contents of this bog body. And naturally, there was barley found, uh, flax, and you can kind of get a picture of what he might have been eating at this time. Um, but what was also found was MPPs and that he had parasites. Um, so there was um, a few eggs found from whipworm, mawworm, tapeworm. Um, and so on the top row here um, of the microscope pictures, we have our, our barley and our, our food kind of things. And then on the bottom row, we have our eggs. Um, so this is what we're looking for when we're um, kind of trying to look through our um Samples. This is just one example of what we could come across, the applications of what we're doing this for. Um, so the overall goals of my project is to explore the diversity of fungal MPPs at our peatland sites, um, establish a baseline of microbial biodiversity, um, which is extremely important um, as a lot of Irish peatlands are now being rehabilitated or restored, but we have no benchmark for what we're trying to restore them to. Um, so that's a big part of what we're trying to do is establish that baseline. Um, 
and compare them to extant fungi today that we're finding. Um, assess how the MPPs can be used as proxies, so how they slot in with existing data sets um, and compare to what we already know of MPPs and their applications and um, provide example target uh, microbial restoration communities. Um, so to date, I've sampled two sites. Uh, we've sampled Liffey Head Bog, which is a blanket bog in County Whisk Wicklow, um, and it's located in the Wicklow Mountains, um, and that's located on the east coast of Ireland. And then we have Clara Bog, which is located in County Offaly, which is in the Midlands, and that's a raised bog, um, and it's quite a well-restored raised bog. Um, so what we do when we go out into the field is we um, get a core, we take one meter of core, roughly that translates to about a thousand years worth of data, um, taking it cent centimeter by centimeter. Um, and then in the lab, we MPPs are highly sensitive to, to chemicals, so you really wanna be as gentle as possible. So at the moment we're just doing alkali digestion on it and um, keeping it very gentle and then we sieve it and then we mount it and um, we are thinking of adding in some heavy density separation um, uh, my co-supervisor is saying you'll get better results that way um, and then once we have our samples done we're looking at them under the scope and we're going to be documenting their morphology and um, just really detailing them as, as much as we can, as we can only to date look at the shape of them and, and how they look. So these are very preliminary results that we have from Lithiad Bog. Um, we haven't compared them to anything. So um, these indicators are just based off um, what, what these fungi have typically been known to indicate in other peatlands in Europe. Um, so I, if they mean the same thing in Ireland, great, um, but we'll have to see. Um, so we found sapropic uh, fungi, and uh, typically this indicates a transition from a relatively wet mesotrophic uh, peatland to a drier um, conditions. We have tested amoebae, and they're typical of indicating hydrological conditions. Um, so some species of amoebae will indicate drier conditions and others will indicate more wet conditions. Um, we have um, cupoid spermatosaur, so they indicate a temporary presence of open water. And we have um, soil acetes, so they um, are typically associated with heather and they're indicators of dry conditions. Um, so this is this is a, a taste of what we've found so far, and we're hoping to find similar things in uh, from Clara Bog. Um, and yeah, thank you. That's that's all for now. Um, and yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so very very interesting, especially <laughs> the. Um, I mean, what's the strangest thing you've ever found in a peat bog? Oh, you can <laughs> people? I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've not found anything myself, but um, there, there's there's a lot that has been found in, in Irish peatlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, qu any questions from the audience? I mean, I could start off with one. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot of concern in in. England and especially in the southwest, that climate change is effectively going to make blanket peat bogs uh, unviable in the next fifty years or so. I mean, is that has uh, similar work been done in Ireland? Um, yeah, there, there's a big push now. Um, Board and Mona have so the High Court in Ireland have um, essentially said no more um making of peat briquettes so oh. we've kind of uh, shifting to green energy now um for them and really trying to restore or salvage what's left of 
what's been degraded, but it yeah, doesn't look great for, for a lot of the peatlands here, particularly Blanca Box. No, no, but, certainly, you know, um, and there are restoration projects in yeah, across the UK, but um, <laughs> I'm slightly concerned. <laughs> it's going to get rather <laughs> rather too warm, I think. Um, okay, we've got some questions coming in. Um, so from Aileen, is there ever any eDNA work done on peatland fungi? Um, no, so that's um, not something that seems to be either we know how to do or isn't easy to do um so to my knowledge i've been told no we can't kind of extract any dna from what we're looking at but i'm you know the way technology is going i'm sure that can very much easily change in the next 10 years um which would be great because working off morphology alone sometimes you don't have the orientation right under the microscope and you're not getting a full picture of what the fungi is especially the way some species succeed in their life's lifespan mm, mm. I mean, so you're trying you're identifying them by by eye is that yeah yeah i mean have you talked to any image analysis specialists I mean, not of... not yet um e eager to ear in and just sort of trying to find my feet <laughs> no no, sure. <laughs> no I, i've i've heard i've i've been to talks um related to um identification of, of plankton yeah uh, using ai uh, automated image analysis similar kind of project uh, problem i guess um uh okay so a, a, a statement here perhaps the frequency of helicospores that one finds indicate a change from lotic to a more static water flow okay interesting thank yeah. you <laughs> Comment. <laughs> um, can you find any dark spored fungi or also clear as spored species? Um, so the, the colour of it will depend on the treatment you used um, in your, your lab work. So um, that's the thing when you're looking at these things, obviously your eye is more attracted to kind of the darker colours and you're, you're trying to look for, you're not trying to be biased, <laughs> you're trying to look at the clear coloured ones as well. Um, I think it just depends on the type of species it is, what way it might um, respond to the chemical treatments. And I mean, do, do these peak call, I mean, how, how far back in time can you go with them? I mean, it, it's, 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 it's a slightly different question, but... No, oh, yeah, um, so kind of the general thumb of rule is that peatlands will grow about a millimetre a year. Um, mm -hmm. So our metre core is hypothetically a thousand years but it depends on the bog you're working on it might grow slightly slower or faster or be compressed more just depending on the type of bog it is um so you you won't know for sure unless you do some carbon dating on it or you know um kind of uh, again use a complement data set um tefra is a really good in indication as well um to get kind of a better idea of how old the material you're working with is fantastic any more from the audience um, let's see anything i mean are there people doing similar types of work in 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 the uk in england scotland is that um yeah so in the uk definitely um the the book i referenced at the end there uh, matthew pound he he's a big um uh, kind of advocate for it um and works closely with jen o'keefe my co-supervisor co and then um in poland and germany there's a lot of work being done on mpps um so it seems to be getting a bit of a resurgence yeah, Mm -hmm. and uh and finland as well and is that yeah. right okay um well, i can't see any more questions popping up so uh, oh no here we are there's one from john what do ericaceous endomycorrhizal fungi produce spores which could be identified yeah, I think they do, to my knowledge. Um, I have not come across any, but I have seen images of them. Um, so, yeah. 
Fingers crossed. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, well, um, if there are no more questions, I'll just ask Aileen to uh, come back in again. Um, and uh, just thank both our speakers this evening for a really fascinating talks, uh, both you know, really important topics and you know, linked together by this overarching question of climate change, I guess, and the way that fungi are responding. Um, and uh, thanks to Sally from uh, BMS for setting everything up for us. And thanks, of course, to our audience uh, for, um, for listening. Um, and I think we will bring things to a close. Thanks very much. <laughs>